Hello and welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ramkumar. I know you've missed this silky voice, but we're back. Season 3, episode 2 already. And this week, we have an excellent, excellent episode. We have Dr. Thomas Brun from the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies. And he is the group leader for a group known to research a mindset for the Anthropocene. Hmm. Have you ever thought about what a mindset for the Anthropocene in terms of sustainability is? Well, no further do you have to wait. Leonie and I discuss all of this and much more about sustainability and about how we need to think about what we set, how we set our goals and what goals we set and many such things. It's going to be a real, real interesting episode. So stay with us and see you on the other side of this music. Dr. Thomas Brun, thanks a lot for joining us today. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. And uh, please, could you please introduce yourself and give us a brief introduction to what you're currently doing? Yeah. Hello, Leonie. Hello, Srinath. Hi. It's a pleasure for me to be in the conversation with you today. Um, introducing myself is always a little bit of a challenge because I combine various backgrounds. I'm a physicist originally. Um, I started with astrophysics and then ended up doing my PhD in nanophysics about the interface formation between organic molecules and semiconductor surfaces. It's nice I don't have to hold back some <laughs> natural science uh, terms with you. And now, since 10 years ago, I'm with the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies, which is a hybrid between research institute and think tank slash platform for, on sustainability. And here at the Institute, since uh, six years ago, I'm leading a re small research group called A Mindset for the Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. And that is a research group that focuses essentially on the synergies between social transformation to sustainability on the one hand, and all aspects that have to do with human subjectivity, like personality development, consciousness, and the so-called more softer, often fluffy aspects of human life uh, that, and how they are part of social transformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. And uh, I was wondering, like, how does it break to everyday work? Like, how does your daily work look like in this uh, research group? What do you do? Um, fortunately, it's not the same every day. <laughs> it's, it's quite diverse. Um, I should say a few words about the, the ambition of the research group um, that covers a bit what we're doing. Because we have started from the observation that many people among our peers in sustainability seem to care about aspects of consciousness, but they uh, said three things to us. The first thing said it's very difficult for them to talk about it. They are often lacking the a robust language how to talk about consciousness and sustainability. Mm -hmm. Many of them said they feel alone. They feel like nobody else is interested in this synergy. So who are the others out there? <laughs> And the third one is they said, even if I care about it personally, I really don't know how to practically implement that in my everyday work, say, mm -hmm. as a researcher or as a policy advisor, etc. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing now in my everyday work is I am connecting people. Very often, I just forward contacts to other people and say, by the way, this is someone you really should talk to. You are like minded. You share this interest. And mm -hmm. I think you can trust each other. Because often this topic is something that yeah. involves also the, the person itself, you know, and it's often Definitely. challenging how to talk to each other in a way that opens the vulnerability of these aspects. So knowing somebody who you know you can trust is key part of what I try to do. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, of course, I do academic work. I read papers and I write papers or book chapters and that stuff. And that's part of my clarification of the insights that I gained through the research project. Mm -hmm. And the third part that, yeah, I should admit I'm maybe most passionate about <laughs> is facilitating group processes. I really like to just support either small or larger groups of people in reflection and empowerment processes that 
combine on the one hand efforts for more effective action for sustainability and on the other hand reflection of one's own mental models mindsets personality conditionings etc so and then of course i'm writing lots of emails and have to do, take care of some administration stuff but i don't want to bother you with that <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah of course i think certain things are definitely the bread and butter of you know, <laughs> you know any yeah. organization exactly but you you actually mentioned that you're uh, so you're at the institute for advanced sustainability studies mm -hmm. so can, can you can you elaborate a bit more on that so what 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 what, what is advanced sustainability <laughs> studies all about uh, so I, I should say the, this institute is a super fascinating place. And when I did my PhD, I couldn't have imagined that such a place existed. Um, it's an experiment, or I should say it has been an experiment for 10 years. And now we are moving into the Helmholtz Association. We are becoming institutionalized, leaving this experimental status. Um, basically, it was a space created in response to a symposium of Nobel laureates in 2007, where this group of Nobel laureates came together and found out two, two things. They said, it's strange that we generate so much academic knowledge and we are praised for all that amazing knowledge that we generate. But honestly, it doesn't reach the places or the people in society where this knowledge is really needed. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. And this is not just a question of disseminating knowledge, like through, let's say, journalists, etc. But say, often we are talking a different language or we are maybe even missing out what's the real problem of the people who are taking decisions in society. So how can we not only generate knowledge, but also integrate the forms of knowledge that are present in society outside academia? Because practitioners have knowledge that is relevant to know about, but that's not written up in peer-reviewed papers. We acknowledge yeah. it's important, but how do we integrate it? And out of that came the impulse to create a space where these forms of integration in so-called transdisciplinary research processes should be conducted. And that's that's what the ISS became. And we have been experimenting with how to do that for the last 10 years. That's super interesting because actually I came across it like several times already that like scientists say, right, like I would like to actually see an impact yeah. of uh, on what <laughs> of what I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. So if I can somehow contribute to society by it, like that's that's nice. And um, I was also cu uh, curious. So, so you were mentioning um, this concept of how consciousness can contribute to sustainability, mm -hmm. right? I find this quite interesting. I mean, um, I think also in your book, which is I think it's only available in German, or is it yeah. also in English? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now it's only available in German. <laughs> So, but so basically, the title is if, when I can translate it to um, to English, maybe you be can more. Maybe mention the German title right, first. Right. Yeah. So mehr sein, weniger brauchen. No? So maybe uh, it can be translated with be more, need less, mm -hmm. something like that. And uh, can you explain this a little? Like, as far as I understood, it's more about, um, uh, for example, also sustainability in relationships and mm -hmm. the way we interact with other other humans can be a way to uh, for purposeful or sustainable life and that the condition of the world mirrors our society. I mean, I find this a very interesting approach or a way to look at things. Hmm. Can you explain this and maybe a little bit more to also other English speakers who also mm -hmm. cannot read the book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for asking, Leonie. It's, uh, maybe I want to add the subtitle of the book, like on the one hand, the being more, needing less. And then what we yeah. added was what sustainability has to do with our relationships, like you, what mm -hmm. you explained in your comment. And uh, somehow, you know, the, the book is kind of the transition between my natural scientific interest in sustainability and my psychological interest in sustainability. Mm -hmm. Early on, I was very much influenced by Erich Fromm. And there was one of his books that very much influenced me, Haben oder Sein, To Have or To Be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And somehow the being more, needing less is also a bit making a reference um, to Erich Fromm's influence, I would say. But mm -hmm. what's the background of it in a few words? Mm. You know, as a, as a physicist, I, I know that there are certain technologies that we need or also governmental decisions or um, governance routines that we need to set in place to guide societal development. But what I realized in my practical work, just facilitating the stakeholder processes, um, I realized a lot of that 
doesn't work if it's not grounded in in the way how humans think about mm -hmm. these like the way we think about the world influences how we believe we should inter interact with the world and yeah. these these fundamental mindsets are often not reflected we just reproduce the patterns that we grew up in and my assumption is these very patterns are part of the problem itself and if if you kind of develop solutions to a problem out of the same mindset that created this problem you just perpetuate what was and yeah yeah so on the one hand that is pretty straightforward and obvious on the other hand it's super challenging because of the urgency of sustainability everybody feels we need to do something we need to do something we have no time mm -hmm. <laughs> and the space for reflecting one's own mental paradigms as part of the way of relating with the world gets squeezed and has has too little emphasis everybody's pushing for more acceleration and then people wonder how come uh, that we're exploiting the earth ever faster yeah so i am arguing for the reflect for integrating that reflection of one's own state of being in the further sense like one's own thinking patterns and so forth and now the twist to the, the more being and needing less is from a system science perspective i would say there are fundamental patterns that run all through the relationships in our systems and one of those pattern is mm -hmm. you could say anthropocentric exploitation of environment and that is something that we can observe in like the transgression of the planetary boundaries but we can also observe it in interhuman relationships yeah or even in the relationship to myself when i'm exploiting myself and run into burnout because i believe i'm only a function for achieving a certain goal etc so that paradigm shift is kind of focused in the formulation being more and needing less instead of accumulating everything self-centered rest in a state of being yeah. you overcome that pattern of relationships yeah it also maybe can one put it in a way like small changes comparatively small like in the in the intra like with other people around you right can mm -hmm. lead to also bigger changes on the global scale if everyone makes small changes in their own micro environment can one mm -hmm. put it that way yeah yes and at the same time i notice when you when you say that um it triggers the question in me whether i assume that my change is only like a means to achieve a larger goal so on the one hand, I fully agree with you. I believe, yes, the, the larger systemic change happens through the emergence of relationship patterns that manifest in small changes in every one of us. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I don't want to fall into that trap of like believing like I have to change the world, you know, and uh, that, that, but that's what often happens in response because we are aware of how big the challenge is. So, yeah. uh, yes, uh, and at the same time, it triggers some caution in me, but I, I see in your way of responding that you sense that as well. Right, and it shouldn't be uh, a means to an end also, exactly. right? In a way. Exactly, yeah, right. Because again, then we would repeat the same thing, right? I, yeah. And, but that's so challenging, I must say, because it requires a lot of trust that none of us ha kind of has to save the world, but our contribution is sufficient as part of the bigger whole that is changing. Interesting. <laughs> um, so I was thinking, so as the leader of the of this research group, right, mm. which is about the, the mindset for the oh. Anthropocene, um, I was wondering, like, in a best-case scenario, um, <laughs> what would you like to achieve with your work? <laughs> <laughs> Or, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if you think, like, in a wish... I mean, it's, it's, it's also... <laughs> I mean, I feel this question is kind of the antithesis of <laughs> what Thomas has been right? explaining so right? far. <laughs> <laughs> But That's yeah, I mean, I, I mean, also it's 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 a very difficult thing to. Maybe it's not about achieving; it's about change. What what you would like to change? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the right word would be. <laughs> I love it. Um, no, <laughs> totally. Like you say, it's. It, in the way the in the question itself is the whole challenge of the situation isn't it <laughs> um, <laughs> on the one hand yes like i mean you you sent me that that question in advance and i was wondering hmm i'm curious what i will say to that question because obviously i have an intention and i do have hopes for certain forms of impact and change etc and at the same time like you also say it's very challenging for me to think in this in terms of like clear goals that i want to achieve um right 
they are part of it, but I essentially let go of feeling attached too closely to specific goals. Um, yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to kind of go into the nitty gritty details. Of course, there are small goals like, and I want to publish a certain paper, etc. But mm -hmm. the main contribution that I hope to generate through my work is, um, <laughs> yeah, I should just say name the child uh, as clearly. It's trusting relationships. Um, mm -hmm. I feel that's the most the scarcest resource uh, in our society. It's it's mutual trust. Yep. And I hope that through my work, people get into a conversation where they can put their guards down and say, we can really talk essence here and not, not get lost in this competitive argumentation where we cannot listen to what somebody else really has to contribute, but we are mainly busy with defending and attacking for our stakes. Mm -hmm. So I, I am happy after my work if I feel After a workshop, for example, that I conducted, there are people who realize, okay, there is a bigger whole of which we are part of and we are really joining forces. And that is something very invisible often. And sometimes only years later, I hear about the real impact of what we catalyzed. But mm -hmm. for me, that works. You know, I, I have experienced many of those stories where through our work, something became catalyzed and somehow played out. And I was just a little contribution to it But I feel that was meaningful. Yeah. Interesting. Maybe I was just rethinking. Maybe one could, rather than goal, one could say purpose, right? Yes. Would that be fitting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at the same time, I mean, you know that as well as I do. I mean, you, you're in your PhDs, you know, and of course, it, on the one hand, it should all be embedded in a larger purpose. But in everyday work, it also plays out as concrete goals and you can't fully right. escape from them. And there is also meaning in those concrete goals because sometimes uh, making something tangible uh, helps you to navigate through this world. <laughs> right. Interesting. And um, I was wondering, like, where do you see the like big challenges? I mean, you already mentioned it a bit in the introduction, like where you see challenges, mm -hmm. right? In these um, predominant mindsets maybe, but... Like when you, you say like, I would like to or like make meaningful conversations where people mm -hmm. can exchange. Where do you see the greatest obstacles or challenges? In there? Hmm. Now that's something where I'm also curious about your perspective because um, you touched on this issue of researchers who want to make an impact on society early on. And mm -hmm. one of the biggest challenges that I see is that there seems to be a mode where we are stuck in generating new knowledge, technologies, etc. But once something is generated, it is not kind of fed into a larger stream of work, so to say. It's um, yep. so many projects. Once they are finished, the funding runs out and the results just stay there and nothing happens with them. Mm -hmm. um, the real challenge for me is not in generating those insights. We have the insights as a society, I feel. We have the capacities. What is lacking is to connect the huge diversity of capacities that are present in society meaningfully around concrete tasks of action, where the researcher sees, aha, uh -huh, the results that I have collected in these and those observations are immediately relevant for somebody who takes action on the ground here. And I'm doing my research in a way so that it addresses the problem in a way that's feasible also for a political decision-making process, etc. But that takes communication between these different perspectives. That kind of connection is what I see is the biggest challenge, what's lacking at the moment. And are we talking mostly now about like people who are uh, doing research somewhere in, in, in the area of sustainability? Because I'm, hmm. or not necessarily, right? Sometimes maybe also there can be connections that are not intuitive in the beginning but so i was just wondering if we talk about right this research results mm -hmm. that are there we don't know exactly which one which areas will be relevant maybe <coughs> for example to to change like to improve sustainability right yeah that's uh, yeah that's kind of the uh, an eternal question about transdisciplinarity at the moment because yeah um i mean the research i originally did as a physicist um I thought it was part of something that I found so also socially meaningful, but it, in the end, it was curiosity-driven experimental research. 
And I see a lot of meaning in that. That's to me, that's part of the human endeavor on this world, you know, and I find it super important that we protect these spaces for just curiosity driven uh, research. Um, on the other hand, also all research that is going on is taking place as, uh, as um, taking place in the context of so social development. It's not disconnected from it. So science as a whole has to justify what is the contribution that um, scientists make for the greater good, for the society yeah. that funds mm -hmm. science, etc. And to mm -hmm. me, that's more than just disseminating knowledge on a kind of public research day, etc. But it is about generating knowledge that helps society address the challenges that it's facing. Mm -hmm. And that's not only applied science, it's... Um, it's more a continuous flow of knowledge and learning between these different perspectives in society. That's how I feel. So not everything has to do with society, with sustainability. Yeah. So uh, I also kind of feel that might, might become too narrow. And just because I personally care very much about sustainability, I, I'm happy that we have something like the research on the Higgs boson, et cetera, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And as you just mentioned, also your previous re uh, research in, in physics, mm -hmm. right? Can you remember, like, what what was the trigger for you to say, okay, and for now I leave the space of like um, phys pure physics, basically, and trans try to transfer into other spheres? Also? Hmm. I think I cannot identify like the one trigger. It was mm -hmm. like for several years, it was just a tension in me that mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I was doing my research first in my diploma thesis and then PhD thesis and. Like in my free time, I was engaging in certain student networks around raising awareness on sustainability. It was the time of when Muhammad Yunus received the Nobel Peace Prize on, um, mm -hmm. for microfinancing, etc. And I was super fascinated. I felt I care about the well-being of human and non-human life. And how mm -hmm. do I combine that with my natural scientific passion on the other hand? So that tension was just bubbling for several years. And um, mm -hmm. I remember at one at one party I was sharing with a friend that I thought, you know, I dream of a place where I could still kind of bring my as a natural scientific mind into a work that is how that is relevant for social change and where my communicative skills are beneficial for people to listen to each other more deeply and understand each other beyond apparent boundaries of disciplines. Then he just said to me, you know what? Right now, there is this new place being established. Uh, it's right around your corner. You haven't heard of it yet? I think you should get in touch with them. And that was the ISS. And I thought, like, it's impossible. How could this place exist? And <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Sometimes there's chances, opportunities open up, right? One needs to just stay open for it. In hindsight, that's how it feels. Yeah. yeah. During that time, I felt honestly quite lost because... Do, you know, doing your research in your laboratory, you can also feel quite isolated. And then you you do go to the conference with peers from a similar field and you're just talking within your bubble and you're citing each yeah. other within that bubble. And that just didn't yeah. feel super satisfying to me. Yeah. I felt I'm part of something larger and I want to make a meaningful contribution to that. I mean, this is this is actually something that I completely resonate with. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the moment, I think we're both close to finishing our yeah uh, doctoral uh times and and like you know more often than not like you get this feeling that okay i'm doing all this research mm -hmm. all this you know studies on these proteins on these genes whatever mm -hmm. and then yeah what what's what, what what's what's the use of all of it and like you know i mean of course like you know you publish your paper you publish a thesis mm -hmm. all, all, yeah that's fine but on a on the whole for I mean, of course, this we've we've done this research based on our curiosities, mm -hmm. right? It's a curiosity driven driven work, but it, it it leaves you with this feeling of, okay, so now what? Mm -hmm. You know, so now we've done this. So now what? W what is the in the grand scheme of things? How much does li this little protein? How <laughs> how much does it actually matter <laughs> for the society? <laughs> I mean, no, not just for the society, but also for like understanding like yeah it, it does this one and we also use model organisms right uh -huh. when we're doing uh -huh. developmental studies mm -hmm. yeah. so it it works in this model organism but you know what about the other ones what about this so you know it it it, it makes you ask a lot of these what about questions yes and now what questions and this is something that i find like in this very moment very very you know sort of 
resonable uh, point, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. For, <laughs> yeah. So how do you deal with that challenge, with that tension? I mean, it, it, I, I don't know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> In this very moment, it's more like, okay, yeah. so, yeah, you know, like, I, I just started to think, okay, it just goes systematically, right? Like, you mm. know, historically how, how things have been done, you know, you, you, you have your results, you have your data, you try to make a story out of it, or you try to fit it into an existing story, mm. trying to, you know, fill the pieces of the puzzle, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But on, on top of all of this, like, it's about trying to find the right, you know, mental space to sort of, you know, or, or in the, the right sphere mm. where I say, okay, my my research is trying to do this this aspect of of this bubble mm. but of course there are multiple bubbles around and we're all inside one big bubble and then there's another bubble around it so you know it's like an like you know like a fractal design yeah, so exactly. you zoom more in and in and in and more complex it keeps getting so uh, so this i think it just has to sink in a little bit more and you know and eventually you'd get a terms with i, I would i would mm. imagine Yeah, I mean, uh, on top of that, like like you said, like during your PhDs, you said you were doing other things, right? Other tasks. So we're also doing this podcast and like mm -hmm. you know, other such activities. Like, so we also have a magazine which we publish on a year. Like, we mm -hmm. publish articles on it. We write articles for it as well. So it's like doing these other things as well somehow bring you into a, a different sort of mind frame. You meet different people. You meet people with diff varying perspectives mm. and and ideologies. Yeah. And you, you, you find, I guess you find your uh, match in the sense that you, you, you try to identify whose ideology you resonate with uh, better and who can you sort of gauge the, uh, your, 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 your sort of radar to, you know, mm -hmm. to, to uh, so you, you sort of widen your spectrum of trying to understand who, who you can Uh, sort of work more easily with who 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 it's it's a bit more difficult you need to put a bit more effort in this direction so uh, I mean, uh, it's it's quite fascinating actually mm -hmm. so there's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, psychology aspect involved in yeah. all of these things as well, definitely yeah mm -hmm. and and also there's a lot of um, well it it takes a lot of curiosity about oneself in a way right like mm -hmm. who am I beyond the researcher Yeah. And right. and I love the researcher in me that there are so many aspects of my person of my being that want to be integrated and I think maybe that never never stops you know <laughs> but right. I feel it's crucial to have also like-minded people who support each other in that exploration process and not shying away from admitting yeah there are several facets that want to be lived <laughs> right yeah definitely Yeah, I understand this, right? It needs this curiosity and this willingness, okay, to ask this question, right? What mm -hmm. do I actually uh, want to pursue? What is important for me, right? Mm -hmm. Apart from what I'm already following. I was just wondering, I don't know if it's um, too much into this uh, readout or mm -hmm. result-based interpretation, but I was wondering, are there examples where consciousness was contributing to a small change, uh, like to improve a situation or to, to trigger change? Do you, do you have some examples in mind? On what kind of scale do you think of an example? Yeah. Can be minuscule. I mean, like can be small, but to make it a bit more concrete for. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Let's start with a very small example. Um, mm -hmm. Like, uh, I remember very clearly from one of our events that we were running here two years ago. We were inviting. Um, we were around 50 people, and we were inviting some of them who were in charge of. It was a CEO of a small NGO and uh, of one of a company and so forth. And they were facing specific challenges in how to address sustainability in their particular context. Mm -hmm. And in the as part of that event, we gave them the opportunity to host small uh, working groups where mm -hmm. the group was listening to them a bit like in a coaching format, but it was a specially designed format for, for this kind of event so that they could listen to the story of this person, like mm -hmm. what exactly is your challenge? And they were kind of giving feedback of what they heard, helping the person to understand how is the way how you as a person are part of your organization, part of the challenge you're facing. Mm -hmm. And how could, could we learn about overcoming 
how your conditioning is part of the blockage you're facing. And I remember at that event, there were two stories. And one of them, he was really facing a very, a very controversial and problematic situation in his organization. Yeah. And through the event, at some point, he realized he is actually waiting for the others to make the first move. And he was not daring to step up for his values because he still felt, you know, there are these big authorities and they are my board of trustees, etc. And, and actually, they should know they are like 20 years older and I'm just, uh, just in charge of managing the stuff. But making that move towards understanding, no, I can actually step up for my values here, even though my values may not exactly reproduce the values of the people who have established this organization, but now I am in charge. I'm sitting in the car in front of the steering wheel. What does it mean if I'm true to my values? And in the way how he shared his story and how it was reflected to him, he became aware how his way of responding is not true to his own values and not true to the values of his organization. It was it's nice to share it with you because I, I remember what a, what a moment it was when at the end of these three days, he was sharing in a clarity and also strength that he said, I see how I am in a different position than what I thought I would be. This moment of empowerment and clarity about his values is something that I feel was condensed in these three days. And another colleague experienced a similar transition. And that, that was super rewarding for me and for everybody else to witness. You know? And I've, I am in continuous exchange with him, so I know how this really changed the course of his action of becoming more effective in his role in, with his organization. That's interesting because I, mean, I was just wondering, there is probably there are these institutional um, rig rigidities, right? Yeah, sure. Like sometimes. Yeah. And then and then there's the individual who wants to change something. And I mean, of course, it helps like when the individual has the formal power right, yeah. to change something. But um, so I, I can imagine that it sometimes clashes, right? Yeah. But I also can imagine that each individual in their own also formal Uh, let's say formal power, right? Can uh -huh. change something, and even by the attitude that the people bring up, they can change something already. Right? And, and that's exactly the point, Leonie. You know, you, you say mm -hmm. the individual, and um, mm -hmm. by now I'm at a point that I try to avoid even that word. And I wanted, I want to explain a little bit why. When I came to this institute and I started relating with people here at these workshops, where I thought, wow, he or she, he's really in a position where he can really do something. And for years, I basically got the feedback saying, no, you know, I can't do anything. I have my board of trustees or no, there are these other colleagues or these regulations, no. And <laughs> so you hear lots of explanations why people cannot do what they actually would like to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to say it bluntly, often what then comes out of it is that people write wish lists to Santa Claus. You know, <laughs> they, they say somebody yeah. should do this and that. And they write a sophisticated report and say somebody should. Blah, blah, blah. What this is from a psychological perspective, it's, it's basically outsourcing responsibility to somebody else. And um, that was super frustrating for me. And at the same time, I witnessed myself reproducing that as I, as I, as I felt. I believe that somebody else who has more power than me should d -d -d do something. So, and I felt that's, that's part of the whole situation here. We are, we are complaining that, situ that the world is as it is. And at the same time, we are hoping that somebody else takes care. So for me, it's about an emancipation process to say, I'm a, just one small human being and I can make my contribution. But, and that's why I'm a bit triggered by the word individual. I have realized as soon as I address the individual in me or in others, I reproduce experiences of being overwhelmed. It's never an individual. So our, that's why I emphasize relationship and our, why our work is not individual coaching, but it's always fields of people. When you understand, no, I am part of a, maybe distributed, maybe dispersed, whatever, but I'm part of a community of people that wants to grow into the capacity to relate differently with myself, with each other, with non-human life, with technology, not along the paradigm that brought us into unsustainability. And yeah. then support each other, small step by step in that change. That is what I, I find hopeful. And that is what motivates me to do what I'm doing. 
and not outsource the responsibility to some perceived authority that can change the world, you know? <laughs> right. I can imagine. I mean, I think this sense of uh, feeling to be or to be part of a bigger, mm -hmm. right, bigger community basically can also help you to maybe um, counteract maybe because uh, counteract movements that try to stop you, right? Because I guess also humans, they don't like to change sure. yeah, easily, yeah. right? Institutions yeah, don't yeah, like yeah. to change. So I guess you need some resilience to to make change, right? So I guess it, it really helps to, to have a community. Absolutely, to absolutely. Make it no, you, you, you need good company, good fellows to not uh, give in to those uh, resistances, which are natural and human, you know? It's, it's, it's clear that, sure, systems don't want to change just by itself. And at the yeah. same time, change is part of human nature. You know, humans are incredibly adaptive. Yeah. Um, so that uh, I also see a lot of hope in, in that capacity to change. But all by yourself, no. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, just, just to, uh, as a side note, mm -hmm. like uh, on a follow-up. So you, because you mentioned uh, that finding one's conscious approach to what one is doing mm -hmm. has 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 had a huge impacts on on basically what what one does or how one approaches doing whatever they're doing right mm -hmm. so like the the you know your own approach to what you're doing changes based on multiple factors mm -hmm. which are also st stimulated by what people around you are doing for example so, you know people have you know let's say your boss comes and says no you should do this this way so you, you can approach a topic in a certain way, but you can also approach uh, the idea of, uh, let's say, you know, doing uh, some a specific type of experiment or mm -hmm. a specific type of uh, social experiment, even in in that in that in that aspect. So how do you uh, how do you balance how like you know what what level of external influence one can, so you know, uh, what one can take on as mm -hmm. well as what what type of internal influence one can have on on the process that one does mm. so, because i feel like sometimes more often than not these two are like sort of bumping heads with each other <laughs> yeah totally <laughs> <laughs> um i would say it's an everyday dance it, uh, continuously yeah. and mostly I feel it's about developing my capacity to just sit with that tension and acknowledge it, not be naive about the conditions that I'm part of. And at the same time, not, not overburden myself, you know, and just believe I have to do all that, but feel, okay, I am in touch with a certain context and these and those challenges are part of that context. So that is yeah. my work now to relate with it. Um, and embrace it as just part of my reality. In a way, I'm tempted to say, love it. You know, that, that, that's my life in this moment. And I'm not a fan of acknowledging that, okay, there are um, like adverse, uh, adversarial um, conditions around me, so I go to another context. I believe more from a psychological perspective, we take our issues with us wherever we go. Yeah, so, the, the, the baggage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah. um, I don't want to move around and just f find out I'm fi I'm fight fighting the same windmills just in another country, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I want to embrace that as constructively as I can, as what my journey is about in this very moment. And mm -hmm. at the same time, I I have both witnessed around me and also within myself how my conscious development of myself um is part of how I perceive these challenges and how I deal with them. They, I, I can't even put them as external and internal influences. Like I said, it's, it's so entangled. It's, I yeah. feel like I am just embodying certain relationship patterns and they manifest in my relationship with myself, but also in the relationship with my institution or around me. Yeah. Mm. So, um, yeah, I hope that that's an adequate response to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I I kind of believe some questions like this don't ch generally tend to have answers that mm -hmm. one can, you know, give out as well. But I mean, it's just, a, I guess, you know, as people would say, food for thought. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. so I and, I and and it's actually very nice because like this discussion is also raising these questions in me, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> <laughs> which 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 I, I mean, 
I guess intellectual stimulation is is what uh, yeah. what we're all about as as you know scientists, be it in terms of uh, you know scientific intellect or also in terms of interpersonal or personal uh, you know intellect. You say something that uh, that uh, triggers me to add some some thoughts here. You say as yeah. a scientist, and I think that's quite important um, because my understanding of being a scientist has gone through certain changes in the last years. And I would say <clears throat> 10 years ago, coming from my physics studies, I had the assumption there was an objective reality that I was to deal with somehow. Yeah. Mm. But throughout the last 10 years, I have become deeper and deeper into an, un come deeper and deeper into an understanding how I am entangled in the very way how I perceive that uh, reality as something objective, which may only partly be ob objective. You know, yeah, mm -hmm. and and that is super challenging. And just sitting with that tension and continuously asking myself, the reality that I experience, how is it telling me something about the way my mind is constructed, the way how I perceive it, and what elements do I have to grow deeper into what I really care about? And my way of perceiving might be part of what I care about. And that doesn't change the reality, but it often changes my relationship with what yeah. I perceive to be objective and uh, fixed. That's yeah. that's super fascinating. And I, I very much encourage everyone to have the courage to sit with that question. Like, what does it tell me about myself and my way of being entangled? And not take ourselves out of the equation. And I believe we had the dominance of a certain scientific paradigm that used to take the observer out of the equation. Mm. Several like anthropology and ethnology, other disciplines don't have that assumption. They clearly say, as soon as I observe, I interfere. You know, I, I am part of it. And uh, that, that's a huge challenge, I feel, for our scientific paradigm and in this cultural context, in Europe and America, at least. And, I, and this, we have exported that scientific paradigm throughout the world based on the assumption that we could understand reality as something objective. My understanding is in the Anthropocene, we have to acknowledge how deeply we are entangled with all our presence, with not our only our actions, but also our way of thinking and our mindsets, and set, et cetera. And we are just beginning in understanding how deep that entanglement goes. This just makes me think, um, I mean, I could totally agree with this, right? Mm -hmm. I think we cannot put ourselves out of the equation. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering what happens, I mean, What about conflict? What <laughs> is when <laughs> when people right have different in their individual view yeah. have very different approaches on what is what should be done or yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess it, it's there's no easy easy answer to this question, right? Uh, But, yeah. <laughs> no, and uh, ah, the the trouble is, I think originally I was a rather conflict avoiding person. Um, and now I'm at a point where I feel, well, essentially everything is about conflict, <laughs> but engaging in conflict in a way that is respectful and constructive yeah. and, um, at the same time profound, not just a superficial competition and then seeing I have to win or somebody has to win and somebody else loses, but mm -hmm. seeing conflict as something as a friction where both or whoever man, however many uh, who are engaged in the conflict can grow as a resource for growth of each other. And that, me, but that really raises the question, what are the conditions under which such kind of constructive conflict take place? And yeah. one of the conditions is I cannot start the whole process with the assumption that in the end, there is one truth. Right. As soon as you start the whole thing with like, we have to come to one consensus and I ha somehow I get to decide what somebody in Indonesia should do about sustainability, then we really have a conflict of around dominance and oppression. Yeah, it, It's the opposite. It's based on the assumption, how can we support each other in doing our best in our particular context that we feel responsible for? And now we engage in conflict and friction and contradictions. And maybe we don't agree on many things. But in the end, it's not like we have to agree. But this whole process should empower you and me to do something more meaningful, more informed, more holistic, 
for the purpose of the common good. Yeah. And that is often, of course, not gu guaranteed that everybody who's in the room starts from the assumption we are here in service of a overarching common good and none of us has to know the truth for everyone else. Uh, right. But that's the big paradigm to be overcome. Also for scientists, because it's very tempting to kind of come sure. up with the truth. You are the expert in the end who knows better than everybody else. And my scientific <laughs> career is based on proving everybody that I am the one who knows best. You know, <laughs> that's tricky. <laughs> so we had one question which i always find interesting because i mean if i go through i feel um culture or like media or something there's always uh concentration on dystopia mm -hmm. right like on dystopian scenarios and what is going wrong in this world and everything and what i'm sometimes also curious about is like utopia like where actually what do we want to strive for right like uh what would be a wishful scenario and i was wondering do you like when you like Uh, think freely like um, what would be a desirable world to live in according to you like what do you have something like that huh. you're bringing <laughs> me in trouble Leonim <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to say why this is a troubling question for me um, mm -hmm. on the one hand yes I agree there's a lot of focus on dystopia and mm -hmm. I don't know there seems to be something very attractive about dystopian future visions <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean it's it's It, the reason that is, I would say, is because it sells well. Yeah, but why does it sell well? I'm so stunned. Like, <laughs> ah, okay, that, that's. I it. mean, it's. It, it, I mean, uh, just as a side note, yeah. like it's also the case with news. Bad news sells best. Like you know, like yes, you know, and right. and and they always try to catch you on these you know off the mic moments or off camera. Yeah you know, like behaviors, which are, you know, like triggering. But anyway, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's get, let's not get distracted. No, I totally agree. And, and that's part of, I would say the mindset. The question is, where do we guide our attention? And mm -hmm. it's one thing to acknowledge, like to, to catch myself and, oh, I am attracted to a certain headline in Spiegel Online. Although I already smell that this is just bad news and it's just feeding my <laughs> perception of, oh, the world is going to hell. You know, mm -hmm. there, there is this, momentum of attractiveness i can identify that in me um so so i don't want to blame that as something bad or anything but it's part of how we construct reality that we are attracted or dominantly attracted to the negative uh, news um but back to why i said it's a tricky question for me It, during my studies i was writing fantasy novels mm -hmm. um and these fantasy novels were kind of utopian novels um they started just with a with a story about a wizard you know and his character development and some fantasy story blah 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 uh, but they became until the third novel uh, kind of my reflections about what would be uh, in the furthest sense a harmonious way of coexistence between human and non-human life mm -hmm. and a society that kind of has established a quite harmonious way but then kind of starts getting off track and what is it that triggers humans to leave that harmony and of course i mean they were very youthful naive blah 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 <laughs> but they were my platform of reflecting what could be a utopia now i admit that i don't have any clear future vision anymore i'm increasingly letting go of any concrete projection into the future mm -hmm. and that's that's on the one hand part of my understanding of emergence in complex systems that I just see whatever the future is, I cannot foresee it. Yeah. Um, I want to trust that through my contributions, I'm part of something that somehow figures out in the, in the larger whole and whatever I project into the future, it may narrow down what I can do now. It's challenging because it really requires a lot of trust. <laughs> and at the same time, I find it the most meaningful response at the moment. I do still have, I, I don't do, I don't write fantasy novels anymore, but there is an impulse in me. I would like to paint another utopian uh, picture. Yeah, I would like to read it. Yeah. <laughs> Some <laughs> utopia. <laughs> I never published them. I hope I will do it someday. But, um, but yeah, I, I'll happily share one privately with you if you like. <laughs> That would be cool, yeah, because I mean, it's, There are really not enough utopias, utopias, I would say. Or maybe I just don't know. No, I agree. Right? I agree. And I, I, 
I fully agree. We need somehow a picture of the future that motivates us to do something for the values we believe in. Right. If we all believe it's going down, then why bother, you know? <laughs> Right, exactly. And I mean, also, it can be different scenarios, right? And yeah, I mean, even if yeah. one cannot control it, can be still, I mean, some, it's like, I guess, to have a plan and then you can at least, and if things are different, at least you can react yeah. to it, right? But to have like some kind of spiritual guide, like to say, yeah, this could be an option or that. Yeah. And, and if I may add, and that's exactly, again, why I want to refocus on relationship qualities uh, with yeah. our work. Also, for at the moment, I don't have a plan for for our research group for the next years. But we are constructing roles and relationships around the intention that the project pursues. And I admit, I am curious, what, how will it look like from the outside, so to say? But I consciously let go of planning a certain form. I rather focus on, it's, it's an organic growth. And I want the nature of relationships within that organism to be sound and in a way, conflict loading such that it's constructive and, and so forth. But I don't have kind of the, the vision of this is how it should look in the end. Because yeah. I often believe we sacrifice the deeper qualities of relationships for the sake of achieving a certain outcome. But what is resilient is the relationship qualities. And that kind of resilience is what I want to foster. And then, honestly, I don't care what our society looks like in the future, as long as it is grounded in resilient relationships where human can live meaningfully with each other. And uh, yep. and I have no clue how that looks. I have never experienced that. I don't. I don't think our culture has experienced that ever. But that's the cool adventure, <laughs> you know. It's essentially we're social beings, right? I think it. Um, yeah. I mean, with with uh, with uh, how you call this reliable relationships. I mm -hmm. think humans like it's it's a very valuable net for human society if the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. relationships between humans are valuable, more harmonious. As harmonious, well. oh yeah, yeah. Belastbar, or with oneself. I to say, yeah. Belastbar. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't know what the English word would be. We were also wondering. I mean, we we touched this topic a little bit already, but um, how do you think each one of us is? I will spare the word individual now, but I mean, <laughs> basically each um, little part of this whole um, society. Yeah, of the bigger thing. Like, can how do we contribute to yeah. some some form of a positive, you know, change? Right, right. It can be su just suggest suggestions, I guess. Right, there's no. Mm. because I, I, you know like uh, something that i want to add on to this as well yeah. so one question is how do we contribute to a positive change and the mm. other one is how do we shift our frame of mind to thinking in in, in, a, in a different uh, way rather than the established you know the styles of right. coming, thinking coming out of the, uh, uh, coming into the reflection mode i guess right so, uh, of course, I have tons of thought on that. And at the same time, it's part of my conviction that I cannot tell you what what would be your way of pursuing this. I mm -hmm. I, I want to share a few of my experiences so far. And um, so the first thing is I'm quite convinced and my experience confirms that that humans feel when they are off track humans feel when they are not true to themselves, when they are not resonant with their own aliveness, so to say. Mm. And I have seen people develop all sorts of compensation mechanisms to cope with that distance from their own resonance, so to say. Mm -hmm. And one of the most researched is material consumption. You know, when, when people feel not in line with their purpose, you know, yeah, let, let, let's buy a fast car, whatever, you know, and mm -hmm. or let's build up some sort of social status that shows I'm super cool or important or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you name it. Yeah. Lots of psychological studies that one could quote. And, but I think we know it from personal experience. So I but below all that, I'm sure humans feel whether they are in line with their nature or not. And this is a deep hope that I have because essentially for me, it's about becoming sensitive to that feeling of dis-ease of like, there is something really not sound here. 
and mm. not being afraid of it. And yeah. this not being afraid of it is really a social challenge for each each one personally and feel like, okay, I I don't have to push it away, but who are the ones to who to whom I could expose the vulnerability that lies in admitting, you know, something here feels really not sound. I don't know why and I don't know what exactly it is, but it, you know, mm. and I'm surprised how many people have this question mark in themselves and don't follow it. And somehow it seems that in the processes that we run here, many people open up to me and say, you know, what can I do? I feel that I'm just reproducing the patterns of a machinery. I don't want to do that. It doesn't make sense. But I also can't change the machinery. What could I do? How could I be more in line? And there is no answer to everyone individually of that. But the encouragement that I hold is be sensitive to it, have the courage to confront it, and to the extent possible for you, speak up for it among people that you trust enough and then support each other. It's For me, it's very much about for, forming these supportive communities that that allow each other to kind of grapple with that, that dis-ease. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are lots of approaches that could result from it. And one, one key aspect, like returning to the book, is for me to emancipate ourselves from these uh, compensation mechanisms, realizing that, oh, actually, there are a lot of things that I believe I need, but I don't need them. It is very fulfilling to be in resonance with myself and be true to my values. And there are many compensation mechanisms that actually don't make me really happy but they help yeah. me to do more of what I really want to do. And that is, that's super in inspiring to witness. So I, that encouragement is the main thing. And then a process comes from that where you might realize I, some people might want to quit their jobs. Others might realize, wow, I'm in such a cool position. I could actually do some things here that I don't dare to do. Yeah, let's go. You know, so okay. there, mm -hmm. there's no answer to that. But um, mm -hmm. for me, it's about, be, being sensitive to that feeling and allowing it um, to be a source of inspiration and growth, not be scared of it. <laughs> it reminds me a bit of meditation, right? Because like it's a bit like feel what is and mm -hmm. and be mindful of that, right? And don't let yourself distracted by things. But yeah, like feel what is and be mindful to that. I would say meditation can be one approach to right. that sensitivity. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, for some other people, it might be a walk in the forest in a contemplative way. For some others, it might be artistic practice and others may may experience that kind of contact with themselves as part of a psychotherapeutic process. Yeah. I think there is a huge spectrum of approaches. The, but the main thing that I feel is in the society that we live in, there is a huge lack of sense of meaning and belonging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we have the courage to sit with that feeling and allow it to be a source of transformation, I'm yeah. inspired what can happen with it. Yeah. In various ways. I mean, I just want to, I just want to add on a little bit to the, the word meditation because yeah. <laughs> anything can be meditative in my yeah. mind, yeah. at least the way I feel it. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I mean, I think this Leonie and I have these, uh, we have some differences. For example, when Leonie gets lost in a book, Mm -hmm. I would imagine that that is a, a, a form of a meditation. It's mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're in that mental space with that book. Yeah. And for me, it's football. For example, <laughs> 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 I get lost in the game and, you know, like I, I'm, I just get drawn into it. So I don't know. So it can be. So I, I guess it's, there's also the, 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 the frame in which one can let the, you know, like these, uh, I don't know, mental barriers down and sort of be more in tune with what one is doing i guess that would be uh, you know like that 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 would pro probably be a way to become a bit more mm. I, don't, i don't know i don't want to say mentally healthy but yeah but uh, mm -hmm. yeah i i cannot find a better word for it mm -hmm. but yeah so i agree with you that there are lots of things that could bring you into a contemplative state of being uh, the one thing that i often like to emphasize is the awareness for our body. Um, particularly as scientists, I feel I have been trained very much to work with my head. 
and it may bring me to a point that I I am not sensitive anymore to the impulses of my body. And often I feel the body can be a very helpful channel to get in touch with these senses of like, am I really like in line with my nature or not? And mm -hmm. sometimes distractions can bring me maybe into a flow state, but they might also bring me away from the connection with my body. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's the, the one approach, but I, I personally, and people may have different biases, you know, but I need a connection to the sensations and experiences of my body to for that for that alignment so to say can be a meditative can be other approaches yeah i agree yeah <laughs> cool so <laughs> we have one last question here that we would like to ask now i'm curious <laughs> and no it's it's a very yeah. ah, it's very open actually like, like so do you have something in your mind that you would like to share with our audience i mean something they have on your heart that you feel That would be hmm. people to know. So first thing, um, now imagining like relating to our audience, the your PhD network, somehow it makes me go back to my own PhD and I feel that excitement of that final phase of a PhD after mm -hmm. going through so many challenges and crises and whatever. Um so I think I just want to share the appreciation and also a certain admiration for those of you who are in that process of doing a PhD. And um, I find I find it beautiful that you all went through or are going through that kind of process. And I hope that it will be a rewarding and resourceful experience for you and that you keep it going until the end. I, I think it can be very valuable to really pull through. So I wish you... Yeah that endurance and the good nerves that it takes <laughs> when the experiments <laughs> are going wrong or the software collapses and all that stuff. <laughs> I wish you good energy for that. Um, and the other thing I think is something that I said already. I wish you the courage and strength to, to sit with the unresolved questions You know, at the end of a PhD, you have been on one track for three or four or five years. And um, that is a beautiful experience to go deep in something. And at the same time, I wish you the courage to lift your head, look around, look inside. Like, what, what do you really care about? What is the larger whole that you feel belonging into? And how are you part of that story? And continuing your scientific career may very well be exactly that. And at the same time, the more you are receptive to your deeper questions and concerns, you may be able to contextualize your scientific work in a way that is beneficial for something else that you also care about. And that would, for me, that would be a hope about the reconciliation between science and all the non-scientific aspects uh, of our society, which I think can benefit a lot from the capacities that the scientific system can provide. So I wish you that courage and the frustration tolerance to sit with the fact that these questions cannot easily be answered, but they make very happy, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, these were very inspirational last words, right? We definitely resonate with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, really, thanks a lot for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, we really hope uh, we could, I mean, if, if it's possible, uh, are you planning to translate the book into English at some time? Because that I, I'm sure that would be a lot of new readers <laughs> for this one. Um, I personally would like to. Um, we have to talk with the publisher how that's possible. Yeah. But there are so also some other articles of the, some key thoughts of the book that are available in English. Um I admit I, I couldn't take care of it yet, but I hope it would be available in English. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if you if you if you could find uh, these and share it with us, we would be very happy to put them in the show notes yeah, down gladly. below, sure. So that people should be could be able to find them. Yeah. And uh, just maybe one last thing: if if people if people want to get in touch with you, how do they do that? Are you on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or any of these social medias, <laughs> or is it just uh -huh. do they mentally connect with you somehow? I'm a terribly old-fashioned person in this sense, and I'm not a digital native. Um, yeah. Email is the way to reach me. Okay. I'm, I am on Facebook, 
but I don't think it really counts. I'm like every couple of weeks. And I sometimes I would say I'm kind of over-related. I care about quality and depth of relationships. And sometimes that means uh, cherishing less relationships and focusing. But people can get in touch with me very gladly. My email address is public. And I do respond also if it does take some time sometimes. Um, but if I respond, it comes from the heart and is meant serious. <laughs> That's, that's that's fantastic to hear and it's been an absolute absolute pleasure talking to you thanks a lot for your time and effort and insight that we got thanks a lot thank you so much for the invitation it was really also very nice for me to chat with you and i find it really cool what you're doing with this podcast and also for your personal phds i just wish you a very good ending of the efforts that you're facing at the moment all right that's the end of the interview Thanks a lot to Dr. Thomas Brun for giving us his time and uh, also letting us pick his brain a little bit on some of these topics. We hope you enjoyed it. We really enjoyed doing that interview. And if you're looking for the links that Dr. Brun said he would send us, they are down in the show notes. So please feel free to check them out. I'm sure if you're interested in this topic, you would find something quite fascinating for you in there. Anyway. I think that's the end of this episode. We really thank you all for sticking along till here and hope to see you all next week. And until then, tara. Offset Magazine, the podcast is brought to you by the Max Frank PhD, the Science Communication Working Group, known as the Offset Magazine. The intro, outro music is composed by Shina Tramko and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. If you'd like to give us any feedback, comments, suggestions, please feel free to write to us at offspring.podcasts at phdnetmpg.de. You can also follow us on Twitter at mppphdnetpodcast, on Instagram at Offspring Magazine, the podcast, and on LinkedIn at Offspring Magazine, the podcast. See you all next week. Bye-bye.